Hey, good evening, everybody. I've got Jimmy Palmiotti on uh, camera this evening. We're going to have a, have a fun talk about collecting original comic art. We could talk about Jimmy's career, but everybody always sees Jimmy talking about his career. We, you know, we want to talk about original art collecting. Yeah, right? it's absolutely. And this isn't my real basement behind me. It's a green screen because all I have is a wall behind me. So I put a green screen up and I figure, well, that's nicer to look at. You know, that is like in what my brain wants my house to look like. But then when you get married and you have to have an actual house, you realize that, although Bill, you got quite the room there. I mean, every time I watch your shows and I have, I watch it on a big screen. So it's like really great to look in the back and I'm telling you, I'm like, well, he likes Thor and Wolverine a lot and look what he's, yeah. look what he's got over there. And there's that guy's artwork, and uh, that's that's the that's the beauty of. of the I know. No, I've uh, a lot of people tell me they watch these shows on on their TV, and it's it just amazes me. I, I can't say that I ever watched a live YouTube show on my TV, but yeah, I get that all the time, especially like the the, the dealer show. Guys yeah. are watching it with their kids, and they're cheering and making yeah. it out to be a sporting event. I, well, I, it's, it's, and it's always like I'm like, did Nikki Barucci get that piece yet? You know, like as soon as one pops up, I'm like, I, I remember there was a wizard cover a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. With Joe and I did. And I was like, there's no way Nikki's not going to get that cover. And mm -hmm. bam, he was there like that. And I was like, oh, so predictable. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, oh, yeah, no, he's been good. Yeah. He supports that show. He's all, he's a, he donates to the channel all the time. So it's it's yeah, he, yeah he's a big supporter of what we've been doing. I, I sincerely appreciate everything he's he's done for me. So he's, far. A great, he's, he's a great guy. I mean. Amanda and I are working on Red Sonia right now with him, and and uh, you know he's he's the guy that calls me up from the company and goes, "What do you want to do?" You know, and uh, and I always go, "Well, I've still got a little Red Sonia I'd like to get out of my system," and he's like, "Go crazy," you know. So it's kind of nice to have that. You don't really get that too much with the comic companies anymore. It used to be DC used to be like we used to get the phone call, "What do you guys want to do next?" Mm -hmm. And now they don't care, you know. Now it's like, uh, well, you guys are expensive, so uh, <laughs> it's a new people we can pay one third the price for, and uh, and that's okay. That gives us more time to do our own thing. So sure, sure. I don't, I don't blame you. Yeah. But I'm disappointed that's not your room though. When I when we first popped on camera, I was yeah. Um, you know, you it, it, like it, it, because it's a big computer. I, I I can't move it around. But you would you would like my studio. But you would love my office. So my office is in the back of a, a comic shop in in uh, Clearwater called uh, uh, Emerald City Comics, mm -hmm. and it's a big and it's it's a it's a comic. I, I say I call it a fanboy's wet dream. My office, because not only does it have original art all over the place, it's got millions of comics. And right. uh, granted, most of them are books that I've done Kickstarters for, and they're all my own books. But I do have a lot of, uh, like, we have, like, a, a whole section of just Amanda Kana licensing. Like, everything they used her art to license for. Mm -hmm. And when we were doing Harley, it was, like, hundreds and hundreds of different things. We're talking about everything from bathing suits to license plate frames to her art was on everything and uh, for Harley. So um, that's a really interesting thing. One day we'll do it from the office, I guess, we'll, and, and I can... I can walk you through the comic shop because the comic shop's like as big as a supermarket. Um, it, it is an impressive comic shop. Well, if uh, I ever get a house down there, I will definitely check it out. Yeah, or even if you're visiting, you come, I'll take you to the store. Get oh. you, yeah, I'll get you a good break on some comics. Uh, all right, all right. Well, we are actively looking. I'll tell you, it's just hard to find anything down in Florida right now. Everybody's paying 20% more. It's, what people it's, are asking for it's it. Not, it's, not, it's not only that. It's one in five houses being bought right now in the United States are being bought by corporations. Mm -hmm. And they're going in and they're going in blind buying, meaning they, they don't care about it being uh, inspected. They're just saying, what did you, what's your highest offer? We'll give you 20% more. We don't have to see it. And they, so they're stealing a lot of houses. And then they're backed by the federal government. It's a whole big thing, but it's, it's, a, it's a terrible time to buy right now. And I think that'll calm down in a little bit. You know? I hope so. Because I'm, yeah. I'm thinking we're, we're putting it on hold. I'm going to probably be waiting until fall or early winter. You, 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 can go up to Interlock, you can go up to Interlochen or places that aren't near the main cities like mm -hmm. Tampa. And you can find, you know, you can not only get an acre or two, but you can get a pretty decent house for a decent price. You just have to be willing to leave the city hub, you know, the uh, metropolis kind of area. 
Well, Maureen, Maureen really wants someplace more in the country. Yeah, so, okay. Well, then, so then it'll, probably, have... it'll probably work out, but I'm trying to balance that. I'd like to be kind of close to the city because yeah, yeah, yeah. She, she's a she's a country girl at heart. So we'll see. Uh, yeah, we'll see. So so I I put together a bunch of pieces, uh, and I sent you some crappy photos I took, but I have the originals here. Okay, so I can hold them up. Um, but I want to start with one of the first. Well, you know what? Hey, how about before we before we even start looking at art? Okay. Tell me, you know, uh, you know, obviously you've been a fan of the medium for a long time, but yes. were you were you collecting from the moment you got into the industry, or when did you really start collecting original art? So, uh, so there was a there was a um, you know I was buying comic books and then I was drawing right. And I was a kid and I was like eight or nine or ten and I was drawing them and. It wasn't until I, I went to a Phil Suling show in New York City. It was And uh, he was a guy that used to throw these small conventions in the basement of a hotel called the Roosevelt Hotel in Midtown Manhattan. And this was around 75, 76, you know, because I'm old. I'll be, I'll be 60 this year, so I'm pretty old. Um, and uh, so he used to throw the show down there. My dad used to take me there. And, uh, and uh, the first time I saw original art, this guy had a stack a good like half a foot of stack of fantastic four pages by Kirby on a table just sitting there and I never saw uh, originals and I, I didn't realize they were so big mm -hmm. number one and he had a price on it, it was ten dollars a page and I was like well ten dollars was all I brought for the whole show you know <laughs> so back then ten dollars went a lot like so I thought well that's kind of expensive and um but I looked at him and he let me look through him. And I, you know, I looked at, and I'm like, oh my God, look at that. And look, there's white paint on there. And I was like, if, I, if I'm uh, going to learn how to draw, I, I really need to get one of these. And um, so I didn't get an FF page, but I, I, think I, I think I bought some cheaper art, like uh, the next con I went to, like a dollar or two pages. But I also had guys, like there was a guy, Rick Bryant, that was there doing some sketches and uh, George Perez was there when he was first starting and I got a drawing by George and um, and in high school I took a comic book art and I went to the high school of art and design in New York City and uh, one of my one of my uh, school buddies my close friends was Mark Texera we were in classes together he was infinitely more talented than I will ever be um, he, he's like a, a force of nature Mark um, mm -hmm. But when we were in, we were there. It was like 1978, and there was a there was a uh, there was a, a comic book art gallery opened up in, in Manhattan. It was right on right on 58th Street, right on Third Avenue, and they had their one of their first shows was a show by Bernie Wrightson. Right, was that uh, the New York Comic Arts Gallery? Yes, New York Comic Arts did, Gallery. Did and you see the interview I did with that guy? No, I didn't. I didn't. I got to oh, check that one out. Hey. All right. Well, I, no, I'll, I'll send you the link to it because it's uh. Well, see, I, I'm having a brain fart on his name, uh, yeah. but he. Uh, but I, I ran into him. He accidentally emailed me through CAF late last year, okay. and I and so he we did a full on doc. It's an hour long documentary. Oh, I, I have to see that because that's that was my high school, and 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 Bernie Wrightson was sitting there in this little gallery, and you know they had his watercolors, all his beautiful watercolors which to me were like so expensive, you know, they're like $500 and for, of course now they'd be going for 50 and a hundred thousand dollars. But, but Bernie was great. And Bernie sat there and I, I was asking him a hundred questions and, and he wrote down what kind of brushes I should get. And he wrote the pen nibs down and he was showing me how to use them. And he was the sweetest guy, you know? And, and, um, and of course I went out and bought all the supplies that Bernie recommended and, um, I bought some prints, you know, he had, you know, they had prints that were cheap because I couldn't mm -hmm. afford any of the originals. But as I started going to cons, I started picking up a piece or two here and there. And I never, never high end stuff, but like jo a John Bissemer, Fantastic Four page, because I love Joe Sinnott and I love John and a Conan page. And I started picking up pages here and there, but I really got started. Um, what got me like really looking at a lot of different art was a weird thing happened uh, uh, across. I lived on Avenue J in Brooklyn. It's like a, it's every cliche in the world, but that's where I lived. Um, right off Flappish Avenue. It's actually where Bugs Bunny was born. Avenue J and Flappish, a little deep, a little Warner Brothers uh, thing. And we had a guy across the street was cleaning his basement and he, he came over and he's you know, talking to my dad. And he came over and he says, uh, come over to the house, Jimmy. He goes, I know you like comic books. I got some giant comics. 
right? And I'm like, giant comics? He goes, oh, yeah, they're, they're giant comics. You, you, you want to get them because I'm going to throw them out. And I'm like, okay. So I go across the street, and I have the page here. And this is the giant comic he was talking about. This is a Star Spangled War Story by Joe Kubert. And this is one of the pages. This is my first, like, official, like, I got this from a guy across the street who had it in the basement. And um, this page, he had this, he gave me this in like an Alex Toth war page. And I said, I think these are originals. I don't think this is a, a big comics. Yeah, there's the page there. Beautiful Joe Q, a great example of Joe. Uh, maybe, I think maybe 60s, right? Early 60s. Right. I guess, because I bought a little DC logo, maybe late 50s, early 60s. Um, and he just, I, he, I said, you know, this is this is Joe Kubert, and, and, and you know, and I, I knew who Joe was. I didn't know the Alex Toth one. I didn't know there was two Joes and another Alex Toth. Um, but he just gave it to me. He says, yeah, well, I, you know, he goes, either you take it or I'm going to throw it out. It's just, you know, it's just a giant comic book. That's what he said to me. And I kept telling him, no, that's the art. And he's like, and he told me that he got it because he was in a place where they were just giving him away. They had stacks of them. And he just took a couple one day because he thought it kind of looked cool, but he was getting rid of it because he was cleaning up his basement. So that was one of the first. That's you know, insane. And, and, and yeah, and it's like, and of course, I'm looking at it because I'm like saying, okay, look how they did the brush and look how he did that. You know, because I, I wanted to draw comics. So every piece of artwork I, I was buying, I was kind of like dissecting, mm -hmm. you know, how this was done. And I noticed, you know, he has this. He had. He does this thing. I'm going to show you like a little, little technique stuff. Let me, let me find it. Um, it is down here. So where, where the guy's looking, and then you see the light. Whoops, right here. Like so, he, Joe would draw that, and then we get a razor blade, and he would scrape the art. So if you touch the art, it's like it's got it's. He would scrape away the ink to make it look like 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 this is stuff you'd never know looking at a comic but when you had the original art you can all this all of a sudden you can dissect it and go oh sure. look at that he, he used a razor blade to do that and oh look at this guy he just scraped that in there and you know um so i started collecting comic art for a couple of reasons one i, I liked how you know of course i love to see the art but two i was really i was putting tracing paper over these and i was using brushes trying to do the same lines these guys were doing and I bought some Jack Davis pages from oh, wow. Mad Magazine, and I was trying to ink like Jack Davis, which is really hard to do. And um, you know, and that's how I learned to ink, and and and, uh, and and I started, and that's how I started collecting comic art because I used it as like a tool. You know, it was something I wanted to, I needed to see the original to see how it done. I felt like there was the secret was in there. If I just got in there, I can get it. You know, <laughs> and the crazy thing with Joe, which a lot of people don't know. He didn't use curves and like circle plates and everything. Yeah. He freehanded a lot of this stuff, and and it's so organic and it's so. Um, I like to call it confidence art. He had so much confidence. He just went and did it, done with it, and moved on to the next page, and pretty amazing. So I mean, and over the years, I actually um, bought a whole story by Joe. I did a. Um, I bought it, the EC story he did about uh, D Day. It was like a almost a, a, a like a silent story with the war, the waves come in. Yeah, you know. I know and I bought that about. whole story and I showed Joe Kubert and I said, "Look what I bought of yours." And I, he asked me how much I paid and I told him how much I paid. I think I paid five grand and it was like an eight page story. Uh -huh. And he like yelled at me for the next hour. He's he's like, <laughs> "What's wrong with you? What? How hard did you work for that money? And you buy you buying comic book art of mine?" He goes, "What are you?" And I said to Joe, I said, are you going to give it to me like as a gift? And he's like, no. And I'm like, well, how am I going to get it? And he goes, I'm just saying you shouldn't be spending your money on comic book art. That's pretty funny. Right, um, right. Joe was a sweetheart. But uh, I, I, wanted to show, I wanted to show that page first because it was like my first real score, you know, as far as comic art. Did you ask, like, could you go to that same you know, location and pick up a few yourself? No. <laughs> you know, we, we would hear the stories, right? We would hear the stories that if you took the elevator up to Marvel in the lobby, they would have a box of art and you can take a page or two. That is before I started going up there. And I would hear these stories and I would like, I'm like, get out of here. That's not true. But people tell me same thing with DC. They'd have like random pages in a, 
in a box that you can go through. Um, when I was working at Marvel in DC, they had the spitter racks and the kids would open the elevators. One would hold the door and the other kid would pull all the comics off the spitter racks and they go jump back in the elevator before the <laughs> secretary would get them. So, uh, well, yeah, I mean, you know, it, it's New York where kids just, in order to survive, you have to scam or steal on some level, you know? Um, so anyway, I brought that piece of art because that was kind of like my first. Um, and I can't then, believe uh, that. That's, it's just a big comic. It's just a big comic, yeah. yeah. So my, my next page I want to show off, and you'll probably know where this is from um, better than I do. It's a uh, it's a page by, uh, actually it's by uh, Frank Lazetta and Al Williamson. Oh, wow. So what they did is they swapped. One guy would ink, you know, uh, uh, like Frank would do the girls, and then Al would do the guys, and then you can see the machinery. You can see the girl's head, that's all. Like Frank down there, and you can see where the Al Williams and the machinery and the the backgrounds with the trees and the and the branches and stuff like that. And um, yeah, somebody said that's a Liz Taylor story. Yeah, yeah. I think it is. Yeah, um, I I bought and, and what's great is if you look at the back of it, it's really interesting because they drew stuff that they didn't like, and they cut it out and uh, and pasted them in. You know. Yeah. You know, wow. so, and the front, you can't even tell. You can't even tell that's there. They did a good job. Um, I bought this page because those two guys, Frank Vizetta and Al Williamson, were like the, uh, the, like the comic book gods to me when I was younger. Like, of course, Frank Vizetta, right? Like Frank, you know, uh, those paintings and, and everything he did, this black and white work. And again, this is a kid. I'm trying to learn brush, how to use a brush, and there's nothing more challenging than trying to copy a Frank Rosetta uh, or an Al Williamson uh, illustration. And um, so I got lucky. I found this piece in a New York show. I think I paid, I think I paid like 300 bucks for it at the time, which seemed like a lot of money to me, you know? Sure. sure. Um, I would have, I got to tell you, Bill, you'd have a better idea. I have no idea what this is worth. Something like this. I have no idea. Um, I'm guessing it'd be a couple of bucks more though. Uh, yeah. But, just, just a few. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, I don't that that's not a market that I'm you know, be easy for me to research over on Cap, certainly. But yeah. that's not one that I follow. You know, I follow more like Kirby. But uh, No, I, I get it. And the EC stuff is tough, right? Because you see, yeah, somebody they, they sold a wild Wally Wood thing today for some yeah, crazy seven, amount of money and what was it? Was it know, seven, eight hundred thousand? I d I didn't hundred thousand. I'm like I'm like, God bless the guy that bought it. I mean, I, you know, either that or a night a brand new home. I'm like, I don't know, it's a piece of paper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I, the reality of it is startling because I don't make that kind of money. You know, you look at that kind of money, you're like, I don't know what, like eight hundred thousand for a page. I, I'm guessing it's a guy who has a billion dollars, and it's like eight hundred thousand is like forty bucks for him or something. You know, yeah. um, but but through Al Williamson. So when I started inking at Marvel, I started ink. I, you know, I started at Marvel drawing. Actually, I, I drew a couple of stories in Marvel Comics Presents and stuff. And then I started, all of a sudden, I became the guy that can ink a book in a week. So when you're that guy and they tell you you only have seven days and I bring it in on the sixth day, you're the, you're the greatest guy on earth to all the editors. <laughs> um, so I started inking full time. And I and Al Williamson came up to, uh, up, up to uh, Marvel. And, uh, of course, somebody told me he's in the building. And I went and I found him and uh, I picked his brains <laughs> for like an hour. I drove him a little crazy, but he, you know, he loved the attention. He knew he loved that I knew so much about his work. Mm -hmm. And then he invited me out to his house, and um, I went to his house in Pennsylvania, and uh, and uh, we started. Uh, he started showing me some work he was doing, and then he, and then he, like before I was leaving, we had a nice lunch, and he showed me, you know, tell, showed me how to do brush stuff and pen stuff. And before I leave, he starts giving me artwork. Here, he's like, take some artwork, and I'm like. I'm like, oh, I can't take this. He goes, no, 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 no. He's like, you know, he's like, look, kid, you need to look at this stuff. You need to. So one of the pages he gave me is this one. I'm going to show you. This is this nice little Star Wars page. Oh my gosh. Um, I think it's from the third movie, right? It's the opening with Jabba the Hutt and, uh, oh, yeah. yeah, and uh, he wrote a nice little note on the bottom, but uh, pretty cool page. Talk about every technique you can use with a brush. And a pen, you know, 
Um, this was this page was like the study of cross hatching, the stuff that cross hatching he did. Like honestly, this page does not need color. No, no, that um, that's and that's what that's what Al was pretty amazing at. You know, I mean, it's just it's just stunning. And uh, you know, um, for for a guy like me, I studied the hell out of this page for a long time because uh, I, I just couldn't like I couldn't get over that not only he penciled it, but he inked it with such life to it. And again, there's not, I don't think there's a ruler on the page. Like he, he, he showed me sometimes he would use a brush. He would tilt the brush up and then he'd run the, uh, he'd run the brush along the, um, he'd run the brush along the edge of the ruler. Mm -hmm. And that's how he would do straight lines. Wow. Um, but it also gave it a little organic because sometimes they moved a little bit. But he said, he goes, it's okay because it, you want things to feel alive. If it's too mechanical, it feels dead. And uh, and that was Al Williamson. And actually, um, I got to spend a day with Frank Fazetta. And he, he he's he's a guy who, um, because he was from Brooklyn, you know, uh, we, we had a lot in common. But he spent a good hour teaching me how to uh, ink hair. Because I, I said to him, I said, the way he does hair is like, I, I can't. How is it so smooth? And he taught me, he says, look. Number one, you need a great brush. He goes, number two, confidence. Don't be afraid. Get in there. He said, number three, thin out your ink a little bit. He says, because gray, gray prints is black. So don't worry about it being super black. If it's gray and it's a little thinner, you can start getting the finer lines. And that was like the holy grail. You know, all of a sudden, Frank Fazetta is telling me how to do, like, he, you know, you know when he do like a, a guy's arm and he would do the forearms? Oh, yeah. And this light brush and you're like, God, it's so fine. He thinned out his ink. Mm -hmm. And he would go in there and just, just do this stuff. So, you know, I, again, buying art and learning how to do the art was like, you know, that was my key to learn how to how to be a better anchor. It was uh, and, and again, as well, you start to get to sit down with both of those guys and to have them teach you just those little things oh, had yeah. to have been what I mean, what a, what an incredible experience for you. And I, and I am the first guy that somebody asked me to show them, I will show them because I feel like that stuff should be passed on, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and it's and it's funny because um, Al was the one that told me, he goes, you wash your brush with cold water. He says, think of it like hair, like it's hair on your head. It's real hair. He goes, so if you want to put a little shampoo, a little conditioner once in a while, put it in your sink and just wash the brush, look it off, let it dry standing up. And the brush will last you for, for years. And he, he was right, you know, because people used hot water and it would it would loosen up the glue that hold the brushes. I've always used hot water. <laughs> What's that? I, I always used hot water. I didn't realize. Yeah, you use cold oh. water and a little shampoo, a little conditioner, and it gets that brush like it's like it's just amazing. It keeps the, mm -hmm. keeps the brush on it. Um, you know, how would I know these things? These are just the tips, tips of the trade that. Uh, right. But it also makes you appreciate the art. As you see the art, you start to appreciate Look at all the work, and you know, and and uh, and Frank was a brush guy, and Al was a brush guy, but also a pen. Nib. He used a Hunt One Hundred Two, mm -hmm. and a One Hundred Seven, and uh, he would do the cross hatching, and he let the stuff cool. He, he used to tell me, he says, when he's when he's really tired or lazy, he would ink more with just lines and forget the brush. And you see that later when he started inking Jarmy to Junior and the Man Without Fear. Mm -hmm. He started doing all the lines in the backgrounds instead of the heavy blacks. And it was, you know, it looked beautiful. Yeah. And a guy like Al could do it without the ink turning into crap. You know, he would just do. And he said, he goes, well, that's me being a little lazy. Because <laughs> he says, I didn't want to dip the brush. I, the pen had the ink on it. it just bloop, 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 like that, you know. Um, so anyway, little learn, learning things along the line. Yeah, well, those two were meant to be together on that book. I mean, oh, that's yeah. some of some of my favorite work ever created was between those two. Oh yeah, Th those. I mean, you know, there's like class acts. You know, Th those are classic mm -hmm. guys. Um, you know, I, I see. It, it's funny because uh, again, I was looking at an auction today, and they got like this crazy amount for Action Comics number one and Detective, like at twenty seven, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And then the third thing I see is a Frank Fazetta painting for for like half the price or so. And I'm just like, I'm sorry, I'll take that painting over that comic book any day of the week. Right. Like, There's a lot of those comics out there. There's only one of those paintings. Um, That's why I, I say it all the time. I really, when you look at the prices of comic books, yeah. art has a long way to go. I mean, to keep growing because people yeah. are finally wisening up to the idea that, uh, you know, the art really is incredibly valuable and it's incredibly rare. And if so, if comics are here, there's no reason why art won't catch up to it at some point. 
you know, and I think that's why we're seeing some of the prices we're seeing. But I, uh, I, I agree with you. And, you know, it's like it's modern artists. You know, we know this. Uh, a lot less of them are actually doing the art on paper. Mm -hmm. So that's where the NFTs and all that stuff comes in, which is not my thing. But that's another generation collecting. More respect to everybody. Sure. Um, but like Amanda and I talk because Amanda, I'll, I'll show you a piece of Amanda penciled in ink, which you might have seen before. Uh, oh, yes. Yeah. That's the cover for Harley One. And I think out of Amanda's pieces, this is the one that's on a million things, you know? And uh, it's on a million. Uh, this cover has been reprinted so many times. It's on T-shirts, on lice, everything. And, you know, Amanda and I had the discussion. She's like, you know, I think I should sit on certain covers a little bit longer because the generation that bought the comics are going to be going in the workforce maybe in 10 or 20 years, you know? Mm -hmm. and she says, maybe that's the time I should sell some of these covers. And I have to agree with her because, you know, we, we've all had the stories. Anyone who buys art has the stories of, I sold this thing, you know, I sold this cover, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, five years ago for this much. And I, I know I, I sold my Dark Knight pages and I had three of them. I sold them for 17 grand each. Um, and I bought, you know, I, I was putting a down payment on my house, so it made yeah. sense, right? But if I had those now, dude, I had the scene where, you know, Batman's parents got killed. I had that page. Oh. I had the page where Superman lifts the tank and pulls the ro Robin out, you know? Yeah. Like, I had good pages, but I got to tell you, when I sold them for 17 grand, I did a dance. I was like, this is, oh my God, somebody's paying. Because on the back, it had what I paid, which was 600 bucks. <laughs> You know, so I was like, I was like, oh my god! And then somebody told me, oh, your pages, those pages would go for a hundred grand. I'm like, ah. <laughs> yeah. But, well, I'm sure you got a good house, though. That's yeah, yeah. And and like, so so with certain Amanda covers, we're kind of like just we're gonna. No, well, I, honestly, that's that's really what you should do. You know, as we're seeing, the '90s art is really where it's at right now. You see, right. '90s art, you know, covers going from more than like a Kirby cover from the '70s. It just doesn't make any sense. But that's where yeah. the where the collecting base is at now with the expendable money. It's so yeah, you, you wait 25 years from the point of origin for that artwork and you're gonna be in a, in a sweet spot for it. I, I watch every week the, the dueling uh, guys selling the art and I'm, and I'm always yelling at the TV, that's not worth that much you know, because <laughs> my brain is stuck in what I used to pay for things. Sure. But now it's like, oh my God, you know, so anyway, I, my next piece is something, I, I you know, it, it's a little bit of an ego thing, but. Um, it's something I inked, and it was um, for Wizard One Half Edition of Daredevil, and it was a it was a pencil by uh, John Romita Senior. Oh wow! Yeah. And it's the and it's the cast it's the cast from Daredevil, you know. So it's Foggy and everybody, and a little heart, you know, typical John. And when John gave me this in pencil, uh, he said to me, he says, he goes, I said, oh my god, I'm, he's like, yeah, kid, you want to ink it? And I'm like. Sure, and um, and and I and I was just like, how do you, how do you want me to ink it? And he goes, what do you mean? And he says, just ink it. And I'm like, so I took all this John Romita reference stuff and made Xeroxes up at Marvel, and I hung it on the wall in front of my drawing board, and I was like, let me do the hair like John does. Let me do the, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, and I inked it, and it was so nerve wracking for me because it was like, when am I ever going to get to ink John Romita Senior, and. And he's he's just the sweetest guy. I mean, John, mm -hmm. Johnny, they treated everybody like gold up there. And um, so I, I inked this thing, and it, uh, you know, and I kept fussing over it because it's you know, John stuff is simple. It's there's not cross hatching craziness. It's like precise and clean, and it's got it's got it's got this. Um, it's it's almost like juicy in a way. You know, it has he has a foreground, middle ground, so worked out. Anyway, so um, yeah, and I'll show it again. I'll put it up there. So, you know, I'm looking at like Matt's hair. You see, like even Matt's hair, I'm like, all right, that's like a John Romita brush stroke. I got to get on there. And the folds in the arm. And of course, the lips and the eyes on, uh, you know, on these characters, you know, it, it was just like so intimidating, right? <laughs> right. And, uh, and then, you know, John says, you got to bring it to me to see it before you hand it in. And I was like, oh, no. You know, and uh, and John took it and he's like, uh, get at it. And he's like, yeah, exactly. What did he say? Oh, he's, yeah. <laughs> and he, he's like, and he's like, uh, 
nice job, kid. Nice job. Like that. And uh, I, I was like, okay, that was it. You know, nice job, kid. That's all I needed, right? Right. I was I was on cloud nine for uh, uh, a year. <laughs> and then the artwork came back through Marvel, the art returns. And I was up at Marvel and, uh, you know, because John gets it. It's his, he drew it, you know. Yeah. And John found me in the hallway and he had put it in an envelope because here you go, here's a gift. And he gave me the original. Wow. And uh, he said, and I said, are you sure? And he goes, he goes, Jimmy, he goes, I got a lot of my own artwork. <laughs> you know? um, so, so I, you know, that's one of those things, you know, you, you know, like there's a story in it. And I, I, and I just love the man. I, you know, I love Johnny Jr. too. The, the, the whole family, Virginia was working up there at the time when I was there. She was like the supply Nazi, you know, it's like, I need an extra brush. She'd be like, why? Let me see your old brush. And, uh, <laughs> That kind of stuff, but um, anyway, that's the story behind that piece. So, man, that's a that's great, and and you really did a great job on it. I mean, you look oh, at thank it, you. And you, thank oh, you. It's beautiful. You know, I I always felt like as being an anchor, like I feel like I should almost be invisible in a way. We really need to see the art that the artist did. I can embellish a little bit, but I I look at guys like Klaus Jansen and Kevin Nolan, and I'm like, they're just another world away from me. I can never do what those guys are just, you know. Um, but the biggest compliment I would get as an anchor would be people asking for me all the time. They say, can you get Jimmy to ink this? That to me said right. the artist was happy with what I was doing. That's why I got a lot of work for a long time. Um, okay, so this next page is a marble page. Um, a little story before I show it. So um, this is before I knew Amanda, my wife, Amanda Kana. Um, she was she worked for... Um, well, she assisted Bill Sienkiewicz. She was Bill Sienkiewicz's assistant. She also helped uh, 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 Stan Drake. Mm -hmm. You know, she knew Stan Drake. She knew all these guys. They're in uh, in Connecticut, and they had a studio in Connecticut. And uh, when Amanda became uh, Bill's assistant, Bill was doing uh, Electra Assassin. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, Amanda was in her 20s, and Bill said, asked Amanda, can you dress like Electra? I need a model for the uh for, for uh his drawings because bill uses models and he uses you know photo reference and and he does it so i picked the page from a lecture that and i got it from bill that is the most amanda connor page in the book because some of this lecture stuff doesn't look like her some of it does but when you see this uh, my green screen is going a little weird over here in this panel. It's because it's a green background. Yeah, it's okay. I'll pull up the, the one you sent me too. Okay. So if you look at the first panel there, whoops, there. I, I, say, I can see Amanda in that. Well, and look yeah. at the last one. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> you know, wow. so uh, I had to get this from this page from Bill. And, uh, yeah, so there you can see it there clearly. Um, you can see the influence. And a lot of people didn't, like I said, a lot of people didn't know she was uh, modeling at the time. A lot of people don't know that. But um, I thought, what a cool page. I mean, I love that book. You know, when that book came out, it was so wild. But anybody that knows Amanda, you, you could see it right away in a thing. And I thought that's kind of a kind of a cool page. It has a little bit of everything, too, that I liked about the book, which, the, which Bill did that crazy Xerox, you know, politician head. And the, oh, yeah. Every every panel has like some painting technique, and you can see on the last panel the bleed coming off the panel. And you know, Bill was notorious for not worrying about cleaning up the uh, between the panels, which kind of made it look cooler and more organic. I think, you know, you felt like you were seeing real art when you looked at that. Oh, I agree. I agree. I mean, uh, yeah. Bill, uh, you know, for me, he he was just revolutionary when I discovered his artwork. On uh, you know it. Just blew my mind when seeing his work on Moon Knight early on, and uh, it's just uh, it, uh, you, 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 you know you could see the, uh, the Adams influence, but there was just something frenetic about it that was so different, and there was just nobody like him. And then when he was doing work like that, it was just stunning to see mixed media work. I mean, that was you know like those, some of those New Mutant covers. There were just weird oh, yeah. things that he was always experimenting with that just you just never saw anybody else do it. It's yeah, I mean, he, he, his influences, you know, Bob Peake is one of his main influences. Right. You, you can see a lot of Bob. He, he, so he came from an advertising background, right? So, um, a lot of the, a lot of the illustration he does has these techniques of like 1950s and 1960s illustration. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, it's so he uses a gouache, so it's like a flat paint. So it's not, so it has this like nice flat kind of, 
uh, look to it. But he's an experiment. I mean, I, I've seen Bill cut out things and glue them on pages and, you know, wh whatever it may take to get the book done. Yeah, and Bernie Fuchs, that's right. Rich Danny pointed out Bernie Fuchs. Of course, mm -hmm. a lot of Bernie with the sunlight, the use of light. And um, it's just, he, he's like one of these organic force of nature. If you ever watch him work, he's one of those guys when you're watching him, you don't know what the hell it is. And then all of a sudden it starts forming. And I got to say, like, Joe Kubert was like that, too. I remember watching Joe Kubert. Uh, I, I was standing over his shoulder at the Kubert School watching him draw the Hawkman. And I'm like, I, I don't even know. I don't know what he's doing. It looks like he screwed up the drawing. And then and then all of a sudden it's like, boop, 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 and I'm like, oh, my God, that's amazing. You know, <laughs> Again, it's like it's like uh, it's sad that we didn't get to, like, tape all these guys, you know, drawing because it, it just some magical stuff. But um but Bill is one of those guys that keeps challenging the art form, um, mm -hmm. his, his stuff. I mean, I've never seen a guy do, you know, when when a celebrity dies, you ever see Bill's pictures of the celebrity like the next day? Oh, yeah, next day. Yeah. Next, and and it's amazing. Like, it's mm -hmm. just he captures this, the soul of, uh, of, of, these, uh, of these people. Yeah, he's just, he's one of those guys that you, to find another guy like Bill, y y you're not going to. He's, he's one of a kind. And anybody that tries to copy him, it always falls a little flat to me, you know, Sure. Uh, where Bill comes naturally. So while I'm on the Amanda theme, I'm going to go one more piece. With Amanda somebody, somebody asked, does Amanda collect art or is it just? She you? doesn't have to. She doesn't have to. She has a house full of it. <laughs> <laughs> she has, she actually has art that she likes, you know, that means something to her. And, and um, you know, uh, she has her favorites. She loves, we both love Dave Johnson. We think he's one yeah. of the, I think Dave's one of the best cover artists we have in the medium. I don't, I don't, I, I don't even, I'm not showing Dave art here because I'm trying to find stuff with big stories. I will say all the Dave Johnson art I have is because he's the most sweet and generous guy I know. And if he does work for me, he always goes, yeah, you want the original? And I'm like, oh my God, really? And I have to buy him like nine dinners or 10 dinners after that. Cause I feel guilty. Right. Um, but he's, yeah. I mean, Amanda and I both love Dave stuff. She has some Dave uh, originals hanging on the wall behind her desk. Um, so this next piece, another story, um, I was at a convention. I, I can't remember where it was. I want to say maybe New York. Um, and Dan DiCarlo was there with his wife and, um, they, they were sitting there and I was, I'd never met Dan DiCarlo before. And it was Amanda's birthday soon. And I wanted to get her a present. And I said, okay, she loves Dan DiCarlo. She used to work up at Archie doing stuff at one point when she started. So I went over to Dan DiCarlo's table and talked to him and his wife, and they were showing me what they have, and they had prints, and they had some art, and, and I went, flipped through a book, and all of a sudden I saw this one piece. And it's this piece, I'm going to show it. It's, it's a watercolor of um, uh, Josie and the Pussycats. And um, he, you see he personalized it to Amanda on the bottom. Oh, yeah. um, and I went over and I asked him, I said, so what is that? And uh, he goes, that's my first drawing of the Josie the Pussycats. I did that to try to sell it to see if they, they wanted to do it. And he goes, I did this watercolor because you have to show color. And he goes, you know, and I, and I did this watercolor and everything. And I said, oh, my God. And I said, would you sell it? And he goes, well, and him and his wife were like, no, we're not really selling it. And uh, we started talking. And then I mentioned Amanda. And he's like, wait, Amanda Connell? I'm like, yeah. He goes, oh, we love Amanda. And uh, and I said, well, I was thinking of buying it for a break. He goes, oh, and he just signed it right away to a man. He goes, here you go. And he sold it to me for way too cheap. I think I actually paid him more than he asked me for it. Um, and it's like one of it's just a special piece because, you know, it's like the it's like the first, you know, like his first kind of shot at it. Amazing. And, uh, you know, uh, yeah. And it has a story. Right. It's Dan. It was just like this was probably like a year before he passed, you know, Um yeah, I never, I never got to meet Dan. I would really, love to. Just a sweet person, you know, him and his wife. Again, there's so many nice people in comics. It's like, it's amazing, you know. Um, okay, let's let's jump to, this is a, uh, you ha actually, you have a piece. I don't, I, oh, wait, no, I do have it. Here he goes. So, I, so, you know, I wrote Jonah Hex for, uh, with Justin Gray for like five years, five or six years. Mm-hmm. And I would never bug the artists for covers because they would always kind of give them to me and I felt guilty. And I knew they would 
I knew they were like, you know, that's how they made money. So I wouldn't, I wanted covers, but I would never ask because they, when you're the writer and you ask, people feel like, oh, we should give it to you. And I, I, I won't do that to somebody because I just feel like that's how they make money. Yeah. So um, I'm looking through a website and Mitch Itkowitz has this piece, this cover for uh it's frank quietly it's a watercolor again we're getting a weird green screen thing i think i took a photo of it though yeah i've got a good uh image here okay so yeah so that's a watercolor by frank quietly of uh wow. of jonah hex and um that's the cover for number one and he had it on his site it was it was not cheap at least at the time for me it was like i think it was like five grand you know and I hemmed and hoard about it. I called up Mitch. I said, Can you give me a break? And, you know, um, and I was like, Well, when am I ever going to get a number one cover for something I worked on? And I love the cover. I mean, look at the texture and the watercolor. It's just crazy. Um, and uh, so I bought it for Mitch and I got it and I framed it in the frame you saw. It's like I got this, you know, depressed kind of wood frame put around it. So it looks like a real Western. And I did that that brown felt I did around the thing I, because the actual artwork is not that much small, not, not that much bigger than the actual comic cover. Right. You know, he works small. Mm -hmm. He work, at least on this, he works small. Um, and I bought it. It's been hanging on my Jonah Hex wall, which I have upstairs. I have like a couple, I have a, a, a couple of paintings and I have a real cow skull and the whole thing, you know, the Brooklyn boy has to have a little <laughs> work in the house. Of course. Um, and then I saw Frank quietly, like a, a, a Vinny or whatever you want to call him, but Frank quietly at, at at a comic con, and we were drinking. And I said, you know, I said, I bought that cover for for Jonah Hex number one. He goes, oh no. He goes, you paid a lot for that. And I said, well, yeah. I said, you know. And he goes, no. Why didn't you call me? Oh my god. And I'm like, dude. I said, you you deserve the money for it, dude. You know, it's yeah. a beautiful cover. And, that, and I knew exactly right, because if I called him, it would have just been in the mail. You know, so I, mm -hmm. you, you can't do that. You can't take, I don't like to take advantage of people. But he was laughing. He says, oh, my God, I would have, you know, he's like, he's like, you paid a lot for that, son. He's like, and he started buying me drinks for the rest of the night. So that was, <laughs> you know, he got made up. But he was, he told me, he said, look, he goes, let me tell you, he goes, that's one of the best pieces I've ever done. He says, it's one of the best. He goes. I worked hard on that. He goes that if you look at the color, he goes, I he goes, I killed myself on that cover. And I'm like, I can see it, buddy. I, I said it's in a good home. I said it's behind museum glass, so it doesn't fade. You know, I said I, I'm taking good care of it. It's the first thing I grab because I live down in Florida. It's the first thing I grab when the hurricane is coming. First thing yeah, I, that. I pull it right off the wall. <laughs> yeah. And I'll play Frank is one of my favorite artists. Yeah, he's oh, yeah. No, no, I've never owned a painted piece by him, but I've seen a few, and yeah, he he's he's out. He's just amazing. The deep and he, level and he of does. Detail. He sells the pencil pages, you know, because he, he scans the pencils, mm -hmm. and uh, people always go to me. They're like, uh, "Can you ink one of these?" And I'm like, "No, you don't." I said, "I said if you really want it, make a blue line, and I like the blue line for you." But I said, "But you don't don't give me the original ink." I said, "It's better to have two pieces, you know." Right. Mine's not the print one, so I don't know why you want it, but. But you, you can't argue that, you know, I have people all the time, can you ink this by this guy? And I always tell them, I'm like, make me a blue line, and then you'll have two pieces of original artwork instead of one. Do a lot of people take you up on that? or, or Yeah, they do. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, don't, I don't do it too often, but once in a while, if it's a nice piece and it's somebody I'm interested, I'm like, oh, look, that's Bernie Wright, so let me kind of dig in a little bit, you know, if it's fun. Um, so my, my next piece is, uh, let's keep, oh, okay, I, I'll, I'll pick one. This is a big one. This one, this one, uh, I did with Joe Casada. Okay. So, um, in Valiant, we did the Exo Zero book, which sold a couple million copies, and it was a giant foil thing. And our follow-up foil comic, I don't know what else to call it. It was a wrap-up book. Was the cover for Ninjak number one, and that's that's what I got. It's pretty big. It's a it's a pretty big cover. Wow. Uh, let me let me see if I can. Somebody was out. asking for Ninjak earlier, so they yeah. got their wish. Yeah, so uh, my camera's not the best, but they give you an idea. There's a lot of shards of glass in that piece. Um, and it's funny because I don't have, like, it's funny, you know, like out of the Daredevil run Joe and I did and out of stuff, I don't have a lot of Joe originals other than all the Ash pages because we both said we're not going to sell those. But the, um, 
but I managed to keep the ninja cover. One one day I'll sell this. One day it'll it'll go towards some vacation or something for Amanda, you know. Um, but this is uh, I remember just doing this and taking a couple of days to do it. You know, and I felt so bad for uh, the colorist. Uh, uh, John Sabalero was the colorist, and I felt bad for him. I had pity on him because I'm like, how the hell are you going to color this? Right. Like, where do you start? <laughs> and, and he had to keep in mind that they were going to use that foil. So you didn't want to put any colors that were too heavy. And then he wanted to use the actual foil as part of the art. So, mm -hmm. you know, it was one of those crazy covers that – I was so happy when it was done. And then I realized I have three more issues of this to ink and it's all crazy like that. <laughs> uh, but I still managed to keep the cover uh, un untouched. So that's kind of fun. So you said um, that you both decided to keep, keep all, keep that artwork. Well, I, well, I do. So, so Joe and I split the art, like one in three covers I got. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think he got XO and I think we sold it or, yeah. and then there was other covers. So I got that one and he got two or three other ones, you know, so we kind of, we were kind of going back and forth. That's how we split them all the time. A, a lot of times we would sell it together and just split the money. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's like it's like I did that with Dennis Cowan. We had uh, I inked a hardware number one for Dennis, and I inked all the um, all the number one covers for all the milestone books mm -hmm. when they first started. I inked them over Dennis, and we just decided we're going to sell it, and then we'll work out a deal with the money. So we sold the whole issue. Somebody paid. I think back then, I think they paid like 10 or 12 grand, which was a lot of money back when Milestone first started. Um, they bought that. Somebody said, uh, you know, I'm, this is going to be a this is going to be a Milestone issue. You know, this is going to be the first issue for Milestone. And he, bought, and he probably did pretty good because he probably could sell that first issue with the cover for a decent amount. Just the cover alone, he could probably get a couple of bucks for. Um, something, you know, you, you always find these people who back then who knew what was going on. Like they were like, time travel is that new stuff was going to be worth money. I think Garib Seamus, his father was one of those guys. Yeah, I think so too. <laughs> you know, he, he, would, he would come up to my table and he would just pull all the covers out and then I'd give him a really good price and he'd sit there and say, nah, it's too much. And then he'd work me down until he beat me down and I'd be like, no, oh, it's Garib's dad, you know, and, uh, and I realized he was just like, you know. No, oh, I know. I've heard lots of stories. He had a good eye for stuff. Yeah, he um, did. Yeah, he did, man. Um, well, it's okay. tough. He, he made a lot of careers, right? You know, they, they, that was the thing. It's it just uh, I can only imagine the pressure to you know to sell make the a deal and when Joe and I did a cover, Gar it was like assumed that Garib would get the cover, right? You know, um, I will say though that that magazine made Joe and I put a, it. It launched us, man. We like. Um, cause when, when we were doing, when we were doing Marvel nights, you know, Joe and Joe and I sat down and we said, the only way this is going to succeed is if there's a face to the label, mm -hmm. you can't just call something Marvel nights and then dump books. I said, it has to be. And we made it our business for Joe and I to make sure our faces were with everything Marvel nights. And we did like morning shows and wizard did all, all these promotions with me and Joe. We took fans bowling. We did all this crazy stuff because we knew that we knew that like, this is the generation that wants to see who the creators are and they want a face to the work. And although Stan's face was there, let's be honest, nobody knew who John Buscema looked like. Nobody, they right. knew Todd and Jim Lee, but we, they didn't know half of the artists. There were mysteries. Uh, it's why on my paper films books, I always put photo credits because I figured people want to see the people behind it. And I, and I, I think that's kind of cool. You know, it is. Oh no, I got a question. But yeah, yeah I, I agree because I was a you know I read every issue of Wizard and you guys were there everywhere, yeah, everywhere. you know convention appearances. You're right, it, it, but it was perfect. I mean, it really Wizard really kind of uh, you know it really had its place. It did a, did a, a lot of people were critical of Wizard, but I, I really felt felt it like moved the moved the comic comics along the 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 industry along at a time when uh, there was you know it seemed like there was a little lull and they they made it popular. They made it cool. Yeah, and I didn't feel like a nerd reading comics anymore when I was picking up Wizard and just seeing how everybody was always having a good time. Yeah, and yeah, no, I, I loved everything. And, and that was the thing we tried to put across: that comics should be fun, comics are cool. When we when we got Kevin Smith to write Daredevil, Kevin went out and did a lot of PR, mm -hmm. saying he's writing Daredevil, and you know we wanted people to get over this stigma that like it's for kids and it's crap. 
Right. And uh, and that was the whole theme behind Marvel Knights. And, you know, I, I you know, for, for starting with those four books, we, you know, it, it was a big influence on their TV and film stuff. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, Black Panther movie is right out of those comics. You know, the, the, the Inhumans, I don't blame me for the show, but the Inhumans got made for the show. They'll do it again. You know how ev you oh, wait yeah. long enough, everything gets done. Um, and even the Black Widow books we did, of course, the movie is based on that, that Marvel Knight series by uh, Devin Grayson and, and uh, J.G. Jones, you know. Right. So it, um, it just, again, it was like a, diff a time we felt when we got in, we had to kind of do something different um, and make comics cool, you know. Not, not, we're all nerds. We're all nerds, but I don't like the word nerd so much. I, I like to say alternative culture. And right, all right. You well, know? You didn't, no, but you're right. Well, I didn't. I didn't feel like a nerd, but I felt like that was my place. You know, until until that time, because uh, you know the comics journal was out there before Wizard. I, I yeah. subscribed to that. Yeah, I loved it. But that, you know, that was more of more of a you know news periodical you yeah. know, types of thing. But yeah, Wizard made it cool, and uh, yeah, no, that's uh, yeah. I mean, and, you know, the other thing, great thing about Wizard was they did they did always have a lot of original pieces that were drawn for. The, the the you know the magazine oh yeah and they were yeah. they were employing I mean you know who knows whatever they pay but the thing is if they were getting new art created just for the book all the time whether it was the covers or a lot of interior things that were only done for that that would promote uh you know like new X Men or something coming out there would always be like these spot illustrations by different illustrators in there and yeah. and that was just cool because nobody would would think to do that and they were doing it. Yeah, though they, I, I was on the phone with them every month. They were like, "Can you do inking lessons one month? Can you do this one month?" I'm like, "Yeah, I'm not going to say no because you know you're not going to cover me." Look, I've been number eleven for ten years at Wizard Magazine. Those top ten lists, I was number eleven for number 10 eleven years. <laughs> ten years in a row. <laughs> All right, so um, I, I, okay, so I guess my next piece. So I, I, I'm a heavy metal guy. Um, I, heavy metal magazine. I loved it, and it was this guy Mobius. And I love that guy, and um, I love this art. And this piece I got here is a it's it's a it's it's um, alien sketches for some film I don't know what, but my wife bought it for me as a gift because she loved knew I love Mobius, and he's very expensive these days, you know. Um, but I bought this piece because she bought this piece for me, and I think it's the coolest thing. And you have to, it's, it's a little bit of a sense of humor, but it's very Amanda. And again, we have the green screen messing with it a little bit. Well, I do have that one too. You I do have that photo. Yeah, okay, this is how big it is. There it is, folks. So she bought me this piece, and it's where Mobius was working out these characters, and it's done in pencil and watercolors. And um, you know, for me, it's again like studying how art is done. Uh, this was a, a very brilliant man we lost. You know. Um, Mobius is one of one of my big influences with just loving comic art and European comic art, and uh, yeah. So I just wanted to show off this piece. I don't really have a great story, except it was a gift from a man. <laughs> I did. I although I will say I I, uh, I did meet uh, Mobius a couple of times, and um, let me see if I have the book right here because I usually have it right here because I always look at it and I think I. Um, anyway. Um, I, he used to sh he used to sell these uh, books. He handmade books he made at conventions in San Diego, and it was like a um, y y when you bought them, every time you saw him, he would do a drawing in them. Like he was just one of those guys who'd do anything. I mean, I love his blueberry work. It's so right. it's, I mean, everything's you know. So the European market for Mobius art is insane, right? So you know, to buy anything here, you, you're going to pay like I, I can't af I can't afford to collect Mobius. Unless I want to sell my car, but I'm really happy I have that piece. <laughs> right? No, I don't blame you. You know, because uh, yeah, his artwork has always been really expensive, and uh, you know, yeah. t today, you know, sixty thousand a page is not uh, just not crazy. Of, yeah, for for prime pieces, yeah, and, just crazy. I know, I know, we're only we're like an hour right for the show, so I want to make sure I get. Well, we no, we you know, I mean, we can go as long as uh, you know. I All right, I think. I think I think I, I have I uh, uh, I have a Dave Cooper piece. I think I sent you a photo of it because it's too big. Uh, the Dave Cooper one. Yeah, let me see. I got to get a couple images loaded up here. Okay. Anyway, they, I I I uh, been a fan of Dave Cooper forever. Um, I I was following his Instagram online. I think I met him once, and and he at one point he was taking commissions, and I said, I said, well, how do the commissions work? And he goes, they go by size. 
And this one is like, I think it's like three by four feet. It's it's big. It's really big. And um, Dave said, what do you want? And I said, well, you know, I like the girls you do. I like the wild scenery. And I said, I have, my cat is hidden somewhere in the painting and there's some wolves and stuff like that. My cat's all the way in the left. You see this little, oh yeah, you know, little plant guy, he's sneaking his head out. So he let me art direct it, you know? Um, and he sent me a sketch and I said, can you do a little more of this, a little more of that? And, and uh, yeah, and then what happened is Dave was coming down to Florida. So he um, had me go to a place to get uh, a stretched board, you know, the board so he could stretch the canvas. And he flew into Tampa with this tube, came to my house, unrolled it, and then started stapling the back and putting it together for me. And we hung it. Uh, while he was at the house. So how cool is that? <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. And uh, and it's an original. It's just, it's so beautiful in real life. Like, you know, I have too many reflections on the photo I took because it's so, I couldn't find a, a way to shoot it without getting light bouncing off it. But um, mm -hmm. the guy's amazing. If you look at the textures and yeah, there is a little bit of Mobius in there. There's a lot of fantasy art. Um, there's, there's some great storytelling in it. If you, The more you look, the more you start seeing people in the background to the right and the, just the textures and the and the painting it's he is one of those guys i think like like 10 years from now mm -hmm. they're gonna be like major shows about him and stuff like it, you know he, he's still he has a big show i think coming soon in europe i think of his paintings and and uh i don't know what COVID kind of messed things up so i don't know if that what's going on there but anyway that was a commission and it was delivered by Dave, and then we got to hang out and took him to dinner, and uh, and hung out with him. So that's like the best of all worlds. Is like <laughs> I get to meet the artists and hang out with them, and you know, kind of keep a little relationship with Dave. I, I love him. Mm -hmm. um, well, that, that's that's so darn cool. Yeah, and, and that that's right in our living room, right in our uh, dining room wall. So uh, you have to look at it every day. Eat and look at it. Yes. So I have I, have, I think I have three more pieces. So these won't take too long. Um, my next piece, so I, I grew up a Master of Kung Fu fan. There is only one Master of Kung Fu, Shang-Chi by Paul Glacey and Doug Mensch. I watched the movie trailer and I was like, yeah, that's not, that's not the Master. That's not what I grew up. <laughs> you know, that's Jackie Chan's son or something. I don't know what that is, you know. But anyway, I, I'm a fan of, and and growing up, I, I was always a fan of Paul Glacey. I, I love Jim Stranko, but Paul mm -hmm. Glacey was the guy that was putting out new books every month. You know, like, you know, Jim, you can buy all his books and that's the end of it. You don't see new stuff. Paul Glacey was a guy doing what Jim was and doing his own thing and coming out monthly. And I bought the Master of Kung Fu's, the first Mobius with, you know, with uh, Paul. And, yeah. uh, you know, Paul started when he was 16 years old. He started working at Marvel. Think I didn't know that. that. Yeah. And, and uh, so, you know, I met Paul years later. And then I got to ink him on some Batman stuff, and that was like a big fantasy come true. And then I got later on, I got to write for him. I got to write a book for uh, the cover was Radical Comics. We did a thing called Time Bomb. Basically, the basic story was uh, futuristic. Uh, 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 th like today, a bomb they find a bomb under Berlin. It's an atomic bomb that's going to destroy the world, and they accidentally trigger it. So they have a thing called a time bomb. They set off to send four people back before the bomb got got uh, got uh, uh, turned on. Yeah, yeah. And and um, but instead of going back a week or, or more, they go back to World War II Germany, and the four guys are fully armed and ready to go on this adventure. And they get dropped in the middle of a concentration camp towards the end of World War II, and they have to get to Berlin to get to stop the bomb from being made. And so it's where Eagles Dare meets Terminator meets all that kind of stuff. And and Paul did this cover. This is the first cover. And he gave it to me as a gift because it was a, it was everything I wanted in a cover. All the Paul Galassi stuff. We had the Nazi helmet with the missile, with the Omega missile and his skull, the full cast, and then the main guy looking really cool. And that's pencil. He did like uh, he did some pencil there for the grays. And then left other stuff for color, you know, the lightning and stuff. Right. Uh, but Paul gave me that as a gift, and it's uh, something I cherish. I worked, we worked so hard on this together, and uh, there you go. There's a better shot of it. Um, just so cool, you know. Um, and we became really great friends, and I still talk to Paul all the time. He's just 
right now he just does commissions like he does uh, uh commissions and he also does like people ask him to do like uh to redo like a cover he did in the past you know um so uh garcia lopez stopped yeah by. look at that I'm not worthy i'm not worthy oh my god <laughs> <laughs> he's he's one of my favorite artists too i have a hundred stories about him and i have his artwork but i don't have enough time to show off everything but uh that's Paul Glazy. I love him to death. Um, I hope I hope Marvel's writing him a really big check for Master of Kung Fu because I don't think it would have existed without him and Doug Mensch. You know, I just think those two are two of the best. Okay, I love the uh, the use of the pencil in there too. You know, that's yeah, that's really yeah, very cool. It it just gives it so much texture. You know, mm -hmm. it's it's a grease pencil, so it's a it's yeah. a you have a light a light touch to it. Sure. So this this next one is an eight page story, and I'm just I only sent you the first page because, you know, because it's it's eight pages. So I've been a fan of Kevin Nolan forever, and he's one of those guys, an inker that is an, an artist in his own right. But when he inked something, he always made it better. It mm -hmm. became, but it also became Kevin Nolan. No matter right. who he inked, it became Kevin. Nolan. And Garcia Lopez could even mention that because I have pages by Garcia that were inked by Kevin, and that's a, an amazing combination. Um, but he was one of those guys that just was like, to me, one of the best thinkers in the business, like him and Klaus are my two favorites. Um, sure. And and um, there was a time I got to know Kevin and I was buying artwork from him. You know, I was a big fan. I have, I will tell you, I have way too much Kevin Nolan artwork for my own good. <laughs> Kevin knows it. Um, I do have a lot of stuff by him and um, he, he told me once that, you know, uh, I'm buying so much stuff, I'm paying some of his mortgage payments and stuff like that. <laughs> but, but when I'm a fan of somebody, I kind of go all in. And right. uh, so one of my favorite things, and I do have, I, I actually, I didn't I didn't bring it, but I my, my favorite piece of artwork from him was a, a birthday card he drew of, of me. And it's ridiculous looking, but I, I just, it's, it's so personal that I love it. But the thing that, the thing that, you know, I bought that people yell at me about, all the time, or I should scan it and send it to them. They, you know, I get that all the time. Mm -hmm. Is the uh, it's the monsters in the closet story? It's the Batman black and white story yep. by Kevin. So that's the first. I think I sent you a, a scan or something of the first page. Yes, you did. Here, I'll I'll pull this one up too. Okay, so that's page one. You can see the zip of tone on the top changes color. We don't care. That's by the way, when you're buying original art, when you see things get discolored and everything. That doesn't matter. It's it shows you that it's real. I don't know if you feel that way, Bill, but it's like for me, I, I want to see all the the nicks and the cuts and the absolutely no no, no. that's that's one of the best things that, you know, just to see the process that went into it. I mean, sometimes the zipatone you know lasts really really long, and then other times you you kind of get this, but it doesn't matter. I mean, you want to just see you want to see the what the artist did to, on the page and and how they achieve the effects. That, and, uh, and, I'll, and I'll freak you out a little bit. So in the word monsters, that's him just doing cross hatching. Oh, really? Yeah, that shading in there is not zip. It's just him with a light pen going in there and doing cross hatching and make it, making it look like insane, you know? Um, you know, he has this fine line and it's really weird because if you can feel the ink on his pages, like you can run your hand across it and you can feel where he's cross hatching and where it's solid. Um, he's just amazing. I, I uh, every once in a while I call him and I gush over him for a while. And I, I know he's probably turns red on the other side of the phone, but I love his art so work so much, you know. So I have that story. So I'm gonna just quickly show the other pages, just because a lot of people. That's oh, yeah. page. That's page two of here. Let's see some nice blue. Look at that staircase shot there, man. That insane. is amazing. Insane. Let me, okay, this is page three. Okay. So, you know, it's funny, Jimmy, you know, early on you were collecting because you were trying to learn from, yeah. you know, and now it's just clearly, it's just a passion. I mean, I'm sure you're, yeah. you're learning by looking at these two, but it's, you know, you, you just love collecting original art. I mean, I, 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 I do it. It, I, I, it breaks my heart when I have to sell it, but I do have to sell it. Look wow, at that. Look at that. Holding that bat in the back and uh, the shot of Batman just like leaning into him. Look at the, 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 uh, and that look at how well worked out that room is. Unbelievable. And and let's go. Uh, and again, well, I see why people ask you for these scans because course, they, all the time, all the time. Holy. I just I I just don't have time. I don't, I don't blame you. Dang, look at that. Look, look at it. And uh, 
Look at that zip of tone, just a little zip on the side of Batman's face. You almost want that blown up on a shirt. Right. You know? And I love this staircase at the end with the the, with the goo coming down the stairs. Just everything about this, and uh, it gets better, actually. So this is the uh, this is it with the cool splash with the, I mean, and oh, by the way, this, he let you know it's hand lettered by him, and the hand lettering's on the art; it's not pasted on. Um, there's hardly any white paint at all. But look what look at the look at where Batman's feet are, like on a staircase. Look at that! Wow, he just drops out the the blacks and the whites and the, I mean, uh, that's man. just amazing. I mean, it, it's flawless. Yeah, and then nothing like a good kaboom. Look at that. And he just see how he noted, like, see how the brush work? He just leaves the lettering out and lets the blast do the work there. I mean, look at the the thinking going on into this, going on in this. You know, look at the look at that bottom with the it's coming down the waters bursting out of the city. You see the zip and tone turning. There's just so much brilliance to this story and then we got some big panels which is cool um but again it's study of light and dark and of course what does he have the best of his storytelling it's clear mm -hmm. you don't even need the words you see what's happening in every panel look how beautiful that is and then let's get to the last page and keep everybody um and then you know batman getting dragged i mean that guy the doctor guy getting dragged underwater by his creation and then batman Sitting there and stepping on those poor things. Yeah. Chris Blunch. <laughs> <laughs> and then that beautiful last page. I mean, I think Riso would look at this and go, yeah, you know? Oh, yeah. And it's very Eduardo. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so there's that story. And I think it's one of Kevin's best. Um, <laughs> that, that was awesome. Yeah. And, and then uh, I have one more piece and has a little story to that. So... <laughs> Um, let me just put this away. You know, I you know I own the I own the two Mike Mignola Dracula covers, and I sold them not too long ago. And I sold them because I ha I lost them in my house somewhere. I, I don't know where I put them. And I told Amanda as soon as I find them, I'm selling them. I, they're too much too expensive for me to hold on to anymore. And I literally sold them the day I found them. I, you know, I, I had a buddy of mine who wanted them. Where were they? Were they in a portfolio somewhere? No, they were between two pieces of board in a stack of things under my house. It, it, I was worrying about it so much. I I over worried about it. Right, right. And I hit it and I hit it, and uh, uh, you know. Anyway, you're better off not owning them at that point. <laughs> <laughs> there is a part of me that wants to sell all this, so I don't have to have the responsibility of uh, every time a hurricane comes of losing my mind because I do. I have these gigantic waterproof cases, all the art goes in, mm -hmm. and they have my name and address on them. And I figured no matter what happens, these things will float around and, and hopefully somebody will look at the address and say, oh, this poor slob, you know, let's get him back. Or I'll be dead and they'll just like party and sell it on eBay. So <laughs> you know, whatever happens, happens. But um, so this last piece is done by uh, my buddy who's no longer with us, uh, uh, Darren Cook. Um, Darren, was a, Darren was a guy I met uh i met him in uh i met him in chicago con he just came over and sat at the table and was crazy and funny and picking on some publisher right in front of my face and i was laughing because he was saying exactly what's on his mind and then <laughs> and uh and we became friends and i told him if he's ever in new york look me up i'm going to take you out and night you're never going to forget and of course i get the call He's like, so I took him to every secret bar I knew in New York. <laughs> so there's this, uh, like, there's this like group of bars and restaurants I knew in New York that you had to know where they were. They were up either top in buildings or basements. And I took him to all these great places. And we had a night of drinking and bonding. And we became friends ever since. And um, he's one of the big, he was one of the biggest supporters of me writing. Because, you know, we would talk about ideas. He, he, you know, he was a guy with a million ideas, too. And we would talk about ideas and, and uh, we would talk constantly about how we would take over the companies and change things. You know, like we had those comic book conversations, yeah. right? Um, oh, well, let me show you how we can fix DC and let me show you how we can fix Marvel. And his, his fixing DC was New Frontier. That was him saying, this is how the comics should be, not how they are now. 
And he says that he goes, they have to be hopeful and bright and fun and not he goes, we're done with the dark. And I kind of agree with him in a lot of ways that that new frontier book was amazing. You know, just amazing. and, um, and when I was doing Jonah Hex, of course, he stepped in and did a story for me. And then I told him what Justin and I were doing for the 50 ish, 50th issue. And he uh, said, oh, oh, I'm drawing that. But you can't give that to anybody. And then when we did the last issue, I told him, here's what I'm doing with, gonna do with Tulu Black. Justin and I had this plans. And he's like, oh, no, I'm drawing that too. <laughs> you, 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 and you know, this was a guy that was winning. I think one one Eisner's he he didn't go to. He was in a bar with me, but he won like six Eisner's that night, you know. And uh, he's a good buddy. And he said, if you want one, you know, take one. I don't want, you know. That was Darwin. Darwin was uh, one of a kind. Anyway, um, we became friends. He came he came down to visit me in Florida. I moved down to Florida, and he would come down every you know six months, stay in my house with me and Amanda and his wife, uh, soon to be wife back then. And, uh, and then eventually he bought a house down the street from us oh. and he, and then, and he spent his winters here and then his summers, the rest of the year, he would be in, uh, in Canada and, uh, he drank hard. Mm -hmm. He, uh, he, uh, smoked a lot, cursed like a sailor, funny as hell. Yeah. Would tell you exactly what was on his mind. The minute was on his mind, which was lovely. Rubbed some people the wrong way. And, uh, you know, but in the end, he, like he stuck by his guns all the time, and uh, just a great guy. And um, <clears throat> so he, we worked a lot together. He would, he would, every time I needed a cover, he was there, man. He was just like, and um, so you guys talked a lot about you know the, the current projects you had going on and all, so all the know. time. He talked about the stories he wanted to do, which he never got to do. Yeah, about his plan. We at one point they Marvel offered us. Uh, they wanted me and him. He, he never he never punched Axel. By the way, I saw that he knocked a drink out of Axel's hands. That there was no punch, and um, but at one point, um, Marvel offered us to me and him to do like a new frontier for Marvel, and <laughs> you know because of somebody that was working up there, he says, "When that guy's gone, I'll do it." That was Darwin's answer. <laughs> that guy's gone, I'll do it. Um, <clears throat> but. Anyway, the smoking caught up to him. You know, he got lung cancer, and uh, and he, he didn't last that much long after it, sadly. And you know, um, it was heartbreaking to me. It still is. Still tough to talk about. Um, uh, but it's great to see his artwork lives on. You know, and that's the beauty of right. the art, right? It's like it could be 30, 40, 50 years from now, there's still going to be his covers around, and people going to go, "Damn, look." That's where that guy ripped off. He ripped off that guy, Darwin Cook. I see it all the time. You know, and there's some people that really do great Darwin Cook imitations. I always sure. call them. And that's that's the biggest flattery, right? Because you look at Darwin and say, well, who was he copying? And you're like, well, I don't know. It's like that was his own look. You know, Darwin had his own look. After he passed his, passed away, his wife said that Dar she gave me a piece of art. And she said, Darwin wanted you to have this. And it makes sense when you look at the art, and it's a, it's a beautiful piece. It's from the collection of his, uh, of his you know, his collection. DC did a collection. Yeah. The, the bar is named Jimmy's because he told me that everyone he met in comics, he met through me. And he felt that, you know, knowing me, that was, you know, sort of like his, his, go, his in into a lot of people and everything. And it's just very sentimental. And there's some funny stuff in this cover. Because he's got every character he ever worked on for me, with me. We have a GI Zombie. We have all our all the stuff he's ever done to me. Nobody knows. Though Jonah Hex and Batman is sitting at the bar <laughs> there. Um, if you notice, uh, Green Arrow is giving the finger to Green Lantern, right there. Oh yeah, <laughs> that's that's right on the cover, folks. That's that made it in the book, you know. And then he's got you know these characters, Jimmy taking a picture of Lois and Superman and. And there's characters on the side. I mean, the piece, the piece is on the cover of the book. But you know, getting that piece from his wife, uh, you know, that's just special. And uh, just a special guy, special artist. Like his work's gonna live on, you know. And and uh, that's the beauty of comics because that stuff will always be reprinted and will always be around. But um, again, I tried to I tried to pick the pieces that mean something to me. Um, and this one definitely does. I look at it and I think of him and then I get a little pissed off, you know, cause I'm like, he's not with me anymore. You know, he would hate that I'm doing this. 
<laughs> he would hate it, you know. Um, don't talk about me, right? Yeah, but uh, but who cares? You, you, Darwin, you got a problem with it? Come, come get me. Stop by in my dreams again and yell at me for a while, will you? Um, so uh, yeah, so that's that's the art I brought today. I mean, look, I could do six of these shows with you because I have oh, a lot of art. I um, think we should. <laughs> you know, but but those have you know, I'm trying to find stuff that have a little meaning and a little story. Somebody said, do I frame a lot of original? I do. I, I have frames of, I have a Bob Peak Madonna piece that's the size of a car hood. You know well, that I'm, you know I like. I have yeah. like a lot of odd things. You know, it's it's not so much comic artists because I do love illustrations. I'm a big. Um, I love McGinnis, and I have like some beautiful scenery paintings by uh, uh, Robert McGinnis and stuff like that. It's not stuff that people would be running to get. You know, wouldn't like in auction. I don't even know what things would get because a lot of times people have different taste. You know, if you draw Spider Man sitting on a rooftop, or you have a uh, a Robert McGinnis painting of a country scene in snow, 90% of the people I know would grab the Spider-Man sitting on it, not, not even caring who drew it. Right. I'm the guy that goes for the McGinnis because I'm like, <laughs> oh my God, look at that. You know, that that's a master. And, you know, um, so it's like, so art is very, you know, it's very uh, subjective and it's very, you know, uh, people follow characters with art, which I respect. People tell me I collect Wolverine art. I always go, oh, that's, you have a focus. That's great. I love I, lo I love so much. I don't even know where to start. You know, I, I, right. fall, in love, I fall in love with the artist, though, and and not the characters so much. The characters are interchangeable to me, but um, there's artists in my lifetime that I just feel like we're so lucky in this field to have that people haven't really appreciated them yet. Mm -hmm. And I think the time's slowly coming. I think, Bill, with your shows, I mean, it's like an education for people. I, I I've been watching them, you know, I watch them before I go to sleep. So whenever you're live, I watch it like two hours later. Right. And at my own pace, like, you know, I, and uh, and it's just this, and I'm, I'm learning stuff all the time, you know, um, and I just think it's great. So thank you for giving me this opportunity because, you know, when, when would I ever talk about this stuff? No, I know. It, trust me, Jimmy, this has been more fun for me than anything, but, but I, I really am doing it because we, I had some interviews lined up a year, more than before the pandemic started and a couple of people passed. And I was like, damn, we got to, we got to start talking more and getting this stuff out there. So we don't lose these stories about the creators that we love. And, and even collectors, you know, I mean, we've been in this hobby long enough that I'm watching, you know, seeing friends that I've known for a while passing away too. And, and it's, it's a shame because the stories that they've got about, you know, the hobby in general, the, you know, the comics in general, yeah. You know, it needs to get out there before we, we lose these uh, these things. We need to talk about it, and and this has been the easiest way to do it. I, I'm not much of a writer. I tried doing interviews. They just don't. They just didn't work for me. But this yeah. as a medium has been great. And uh, and like everybody says, we can book the next five interviews, okay. Jenny, over the over over well, the. I like to see. I like to see Wayne. Wayne's a big fan of Amanda. So I love to see Wayne. Wayne. You know, Wayne. I actually made a list the other day. Great guy. Wayne's in a, in the chat a lot, and. And I made a list of uh, people who I wanted to add to to uh, my chat list, and Wayne was on it. So he's he's one of the person. Wayne know. Wayne has got some collection. Have you seen his collection? Oh my God, he's. But again, you know, like again, and this is the other part of business I love, right? The, the you get to know some of the people, the collectors. These are, I gotta say, people, the comic people are really smart people. They're really they're open minded. They love new stuff. They mm -hmm. they have this they have this kind of. Um, energy that that um i think a lot of people don't you know it, it's it's funny right because we we go through life we love so much stuff you know we see new art we see new co and then you meet people and you ask what do you do or what do you collect They're like i don't know i just watch tv and i'm like what like but what what's your passion <laughs> you know and and they like they have nothing i don't know staying alive and i'm like oh okay like it's just such an interesting thing for me um, right no no it, you know, we've talked a lot about that too. That you can't make an art collector. I mean, we're we're kind of geared in a, yeah. in a specific way, and uh, so it's hard. You know, you can get people to like comics and buy T-shirts with their favorite characters on them, right. but to try to convince them to buy art, it's 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 something you've got it in you or you don't. And it's it, it's a, it's a tough. I mean, it's good for us, right? It's like not everybody's going to walk in and just want to become art collectors. No, we have enough competition. But, uh, but that's what's special about it. I mean, yeah. what, and I really learned that through doing these interviews because uh, so many collectors, you know, they they look at the art so differently than me. You know, they, they really look at the 
you know, the perspective and, and the way the inks are, and, and, and going into it is I, I thought I, I enjoyed it that way. I didn't realize most everyone that collects art enjoys it, that they, they appreciate it for the work. It's yeah. not, and, you know, they love the stories too, but man, they, they get the craft more than I ever thought. Oh uh, yeah. I, mean, I, I could teach a class just dissecting that Kevin Nolan story. Sure. You know, because it's like, you look at it and it's like it, like your brain, it's like tasty, you know, it's you like, it's lush. Right. And then you start seeing where he drops out things and doesn't, and you're like, my God, like, how do you even start thinking like that? Like, how does your brain even interpret that? You know? And I always find, and maybe you, you, maybe you can back me up on this or you can tell me I'm wrong. Okay. The best artists are the ones that think their artwork is like, yeah, it's okay. You know, like they don't, there's no bravura. The bravura guys, the stuff's always like, it's okay. But the, the guys that are really like amazing, mm -hmm. they're so humble. You know, they're so humble about their own work and it always blows my mind, you know, and it's so, and it, like I said, going to Al Williams's house, he was giving me stuff. When I was with Frank, said, Frank drew me a drawing in, in, a, in a book, in a book I had that I bought from the uh, museum and Ellie came in, his wife came in and said, you can't give that drawing to Jimmy because we sell your drawings on a, whatever, you know, she started going and Frank got an electric eraser and er had to erase it. My book. And, uh, and as soon as Ellie left the room, he's like, I really, I apologize for that. I, you know, and I'm like, I said, dude, I'm spending the day with Frank Fazzetto. I said, I don't care. I, I said, you, you know, it's just great being here. You know, I, I uh, you well, know, it's a lot like that. You said when you sat down with Bernie Wrightson at the New York comic arts gallery mm -hmm. and he was just humble and he was willing to talk to you as well. Oh, yeah. work. You know, that's, that's like you say, those are the guys that just blow you away because they, they, they just they're cranking out the work but they're not that you know there, there's no ego there and i think that that's what makes them special you know and I, and I think that and it makes them unique those are the kind of guys whose work stands out you know it's not yeah. like the journeyman who's you know who are all who we need you know but the, but there's those people like darwin or like bernie that just you know uh, you, you i don't know you guys say you can't replace them but they, they yeah, no, you, you can't i mean bernie you know i mean Look at the amount of work he did and look how the influence. I mean, you know, you, nobody could ever draw a Batman cape or no. a Swamp Thing after him. You know, like it just there's like things that they each did that was like so special. But I but I noticed the ones I love are the ones that are, understand storytelling. Mm -hmm. They actually and this is the thing I always tell new artists. You need your character to look at the reader when they're talking. Don't do this to each other. Look at the reader, because the, the best guys always have that head talking to you. Right. And it, it hits you. Like there's something there. You know, uh it's 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 funny what like I said, I think being an editor during all the nights taught me a lot of stuff too, because I you know, I, knowing guys like Archie Goodwood, you know, I think I've just been like this giant sponge absorbing all these people's like talent and things and you know, I, I again with my own books. I try to, I, I keep trying. You know, it's there's no lack of people on the internet. If you if you want to have your ego destroyed, um, every time I put out a book, there's a certain amount of people tell me it's crap or whatever. And I'm always like, well, you know, if you don't like it, thanks for buying it, and you can buy something else. Yeah. But it, it always keeps you working harder too. You know, it makes you like trying harder. So uh, yeah. Just uh, like I said, this I, your shows have been great, and this was a lot of fun because, again, I, I can go on for hours. But I, I, I stupid me, I didn't bring a bottle of water. To go, you know? <laughs> I understand. Well, no, we're gonna, we're gonna schedule another one for sure. Okay, because now great. I need water. That's great, <clears throat> man. But uh, yeah, so I'm gonna be on vacation. I, I'm gonna be down in Florida for ten days. I, I get there uh, Saturday afternoon. I'm gonna be in the Keys for a few days, and then I'll be in Orlando. And then up by Ocala for a few days as well. So I'm going to kind of get around, look at a few. Yeah, hours. You, let, let's talk, uh, and uh, you know, uh, we, we'll find a common ground. I know where you. I know the route you're doing. You're going yeah. right through. Yeah, man. It's All rainy right. season. I'm just going to warn you. It's rainy season. I know. Well, it's always, right. well, summer's always rainy, right? It rains every day in Florida. It, it, in the around four o'clock, it rains for like 20 minutes. <laughs> and then you, then the sun comes out and you and you're complaining about the heat again. So it's <laughs> right, right. Uh, but all right, Jimmy, we are going to book okay. another one of these definitely before awesome. the end of the year. Awesome. I really, I can't tell you this has been a lot of fun and more fun than I, I, I knew it was going to be fun. I didn't think it was going to be this fun, but uh, great. But yeah, you, great time. You'll have to pick another dozen artworks out to talk. Easy about. to do. Easy to do. I got them lined up. 
There's no <laughs> Mignola uh, Dracula covers, so. though. No, but I have Mignola. I have something yeah. else. But All right. Yeah. All right. <laughs> All right, everybody. Well, thank you so much. It's been a lot of fun, and I'm, I'm sure I've seen a lot of positive comments in here, so we know we're going to be able to do this one again. Jimmy, thank you so thank much, you. and uh, we'll be talking again soon.